Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Ram Ram. Ram Ram. Hare Hare. Hare. Shri Krishna Krishna Hare Hare. Prahlad Maharaj Mahar Singh Hare Bhagwan Ki Jai. Jagat Puri Shri Prabhupada. Jai. Thank you all for joining us. If you can all kind of come closer. Because more devotees will come when, as the time progresses. So we're all happy to see you for our Sunday Peace program. Uh, we have a very special guest, His Holiness Ramakrishna Swami Maharaj. Maharaj is a disciple of this divine grace relates to Matthew Alpha Swami Prabhupada. He's a founder of Italia for the International Society of Krishna Consciousness. So Maharaj is is initiating spiritual master uh, in our society, travels throughout the United States, Asia, introducing and guiding many souls in the process of developing love of God, Krishna consciousness. So, and also very well known for the Iskand Digest, which has thousands of question and answers from many devotees throughout the world on all the top spiritual topics. I recommend you look at it. It's a sublime site called hhnorbhatswami.com. So please take a look at it. You'll find it very nourishing for your spiritual life. So we've been engaged in hearing about the Guru Maharaj pastimes, the glories of, of that particular pastime and the deep instructions that are within that pastime. So Maharaj is going to have a very exciting and uh, profound lecture today on the prayers of Guru Maharaj. So please pay your kind attention and thank you all for coming. Let's welcome Maharaj with a loud Hari Bol. Hari Bol! Hari Bol! Hari Bol! This morning, that I changed a little bit because there's 12 prayers and there isn't time to cover all 12 prayers. And so next time I come, we'll start with the prayers because it's getting halfway through. And then, so, um, instead, this is, this is the plan is as far as the Dhruva Maharaj story, is just to do a summary of the whole section. And we'll start with Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur. Probably all of you know who he is. If you don't, uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur was the spiritual master of our founder Acharya, Shiva Prabhupada. And today is honoring on the lunar calendar his disappearance day. And this is the date of his disappearance. So it gives you some idea of the duration of time that he lived. The uh, late 1800s, the early 1900s was the span of his life, his 
preaching. As you see from the uh, photograph here, he was a sannyasi. Not only a sannyasi, but his whole life was a very strict brahmachari and eventually took sannyas uh, in the later stages of his life. Even when he was a young high school boy in his education, he was trying to inspire those who were his close friends to take a lifelong vow of reading Brahmacharya. He didn't have too many thinkers. But he stayed with that his whole life. Actually, for Brahmacharya. And there's many things that we can say in his honor on his disappearance day. And I thought I would share just a few things. One of them uh, came to my WhatsApp message this morning, and I'd like to read it to you. Um, Bhakti Siddhanta was prolific. He wrote many, many literatures and translated many literatures and many essays and was famous for his publication using technology because from the time of his father, Bhakti Thakur, the printing press was just coming into being. There was no printing press before that. So his father took interest in printing presses and he trained his son, Bhakti Siddhanta, in how to propagate the message of Krishna consciousness through that medium of technology, which was modern technology at that time. He taught him how to write, how to proofread, how to typeset, how to choose the proper font, how to choose the binding, how to choose A to Z. He, Bhakti Siddhanta became a proofreader of his father's writings, Bhakti Vinodhakura's writings. And um, during this period of time when he was an Acharya, he accepted the Sanyas order for that, that purpose. There were many printing presses going around the clock in different locations, but there's lots of details, but it was, he was very fond of magazines, newspapers, books, periodicals, etc. Volumes and volumes and volumes of so giving the message through the printed word. It was a very important strategy that he was involved with. Now I'm going to read something about his strategy. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur had a limousine back in the 1930s. I'll show you a picture of that limousine in a moment. And he dressed nicely. He would always wear a dhoti, but on occasion, as required, he would also don a double-breasted coat stockings and shoes. For receiving special guests, he had fine furniture. Thus, referring to the elite, he said, quote, we are preaching by approaching the people of the world, dressed even somewhat better than they, showing knowledge even somewhat greater than theirs being even somewhere more stylish than they, without which they would think us worthless and not listen to our harikata. I have to go to various places for propagating harikata, so I must present myself as a learned and decent gentleman, semicolon. Otherwise, non-devotees will not give me their time. He used all means to broadcast the message of Krishna. 
Okay, so the, the principle, of course, the, the previous slide shows, like Srila Prabhupada, he was very contented to um, dress very simply in sannyas attire. For those of you that know a little bit about our lineage, Haridas Thakur was the Acharya for the chanting of the Holy Name, and Haridas Thakur had a vow that he would chant 300,000 names, 3 lakhs of names every day, which meant 3 times 64 rounds every day. That's a lot of rounds every day. Think about it. Three times sixty-four every day. You do the math and if you chant your sixteen rounds in two hours, it would take you twenty-four hours to do that. No eating, no sleeping, no bathing, no brushing your teeth, no nothing. Just and then the next day and the next day. Bhakti Siddhanta, so he chanted more swiftly, obviously. Bhakti Siddhanta made the same vow and he kept it for some number of years. Living a very austere life. So he was he was on another platform. He demonstrated to the world. He wasn't of this world. He was his consciousness was beyond the temporary. And yet, for the sake of, uh, one can imagine, it was uncomfortable to dress as he was describing here. But here's, here's in this photo, this is actually taken in Vrindavan. It's not, one of, not, not only a car in the 1930s, but a convertible. <laughs> and it is said in his biography that he would specifically go to Vrindavan and he would drive through the streets of Vrindavan waving to everybody. <laughs> because his message was Yukta Vairagya, you know, those who know this, a sannyasi is not supposed to wear by strict rules clothing that was sewn. A sannyasi is not supposed to wear shoes. A sannyasi is not supposed to ride in any conveyance. So fancy clothes, riding in a convertible, waving to everybody. With the message, not just like, we're one of you, but his message was also the message of Yukta Vairagya. Anything and everything can be used in Krishna's service. Anything it's Yukta Vairagya. The, the, the real sense, Rupa Goswami's teachings go like this, just put it real simple. Giving up things, renouncing things that are the property of Hari, that's false renunciation, Pavu Vairagya. But utilizing all things that are in relation to Hari without attachment to those things, that's complete renunciation. Utilizing these everything comes from a source. So connect those every things to the source with devotion, without attachment. Anasa Kasha Vishaya, without attachment to Vishaya, to being the enjoyer of those things. So he wasn't riding in convertibles so he could be the enjoyer of showing off I'm riding in convertible. Ha ha ha. It was he was instructed a principle. One of the, in addition to printing press, one of the things that he liked very much was dioramas. The first time I visited Vrindavan was 1973 or something like that. And we were taken by Guru Das, one of the Prabhupada's disciples, to a place where a very primitive diorama was on display. It wasn't even in this Khan temple, it was some other place. And it was um, 
kind of three-dimensional. We're showing the, the terrain of Vrindavan. You know, there's Govardhan Hill over there. There's Nandagram over there. And so it was sculpted like that, some kind of material. And then underneath was a set of chains. So it worked by a crank on the outside. You make a little motion like this. And there comes Krishna and the cowherd boys herding the cows, and they leave Nandagram and they go to Govardhan Hill. And that's as far as it went. They have to crank it back and they go backwards up to <laughs> Nandagram and then crank it again. And they go off from Nandagram and go here and there and go to Govardhan Hill. So he was using technology that was available at the time to show to people the pastime of Krishna. As that little quote said, any, any medium that would be effective. So in, in Dhaka, in January of 1933, it took a couple of years, but he engaged artisans um, to create a, um, a display a three-dimensional, what Prabhupada called dioramas, but there's a, a um, there's a tradition in Bengal that artisans know how to make dolls. Certainly not how to make dolls of Durga, but they make dolls of you know this one, that one, and the other one. So it's, it's, it's an art skill. So he engaged those artisans to depict pastimes of Krishna. And in Dhaka, in January 1933, he went there for a whole month to have a big festival. A centerpiece of that was the um, dioramas. And with gesture to the dioramas, he would then explain Krishna, Krishna's pastime, and his transcendence. And in that same visit in Dhaka, it's described, for one month, he wanted to prove a point. The point he wanted to prove was the Bhagavatam's message is unlimited. So he took one verse, 111 Bhagavatam, and for one month he spoke on the one verse without repeating himself for a whole month, any of the messages. And his speaking was very elevated. Prabhupada said, and a little, little Prabhupada story along with this. Tamal Krishna told me this story. <clears throat> Prabhupada was in um, doing his world Sankirtan party tour in India, and there was a Pandal program where they had Achyutananda leading lively kirtan, and everyone dancing, and people in the audience were up and dancing, and then the kirtan was over. And because of the nature of the audience, Prabhupada began speaking in Hindi. So all the sannyasis that were on the stage looked at each other. They followed Tamal Krishna Maharaj because he was always the leader. And he stood up and started to walk off the stage. And Prabhupada stopped speaking and said, where are you going? And he said, well, Prabhupada, we don't understand Hindi, and so we thought it would be best if we get off the stage. And Prabhupada said, even if you don't understand Hindi, this is right in the public forum. Even if you don't understand Hindi, you should stay and hear because that hearing will be purifying for you. And then later, he in the room, after that Pandal program, he said, Prabhupada said about Bhakti Siddhanta, his speaking was so high. Many times I couldn't understand what he was saying. His words were, my brain was puzzled. But I stayed and I heard because I had faith that the sound vibration would purify me. And that is my qualification today for being able to speak. Because I had faith in the sound vibration from Bhakti Siddhanta that I would become purified and qualified that way. Something from his biography is very interesting. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur revealed that Hari Katha is the Swarup Shakti of Harinam, 
which means just as Krishna is properly worshipped not alone but with his Swarup Shakti Shivata, recitation of Harinam is incomplete and improper unless accompanied by hearing Harikata. So his expertise was not so much in singing, the Kirtan part, he had others singing and he would do the Harikata part. But they go together or one is incomplete without the other. And this very same principle that Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur deployed, those of you that are with us on Friday evening, you saw this image. From Chaitanya Bhagwat, we find this message. The characteristics of Prahlad are described in the seventh canto of Srimad Bhagavatam and the characteristics of Dhruva are described in the fourth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Sri Hidadhar Pantit Goswami was the speaker of Srimad Bhagavatam and Sri Gaurasundara was the listener. He attentively heard topics of Prahlad and Dhruva's cultivation of devotional service from the mouth of Hidadhar hundreds of times. And many of you know the story of Dhruva, you've heard many, many times, maybe not hundreds, but it's good to hear again and again and again and again and the nature of the message of Srimad Bhagavatam, as you hear it again and again, the heart becomes further cleansed, further realizations, further connection with the message of devotional service and the object of devotional service, the personality of Godhead. One more message from Bhakti Siddhanta, and we'll begin the Dhruva narration. It connects with the Dhruva narration. God is the shelter of all. He sends many obstacles and inconveniences to those who wish for shelter under him in order to test the ardor and steadiness. So, Dhruva had his ardor and steadiness tested by the circumstance that he was put through and he really got 4.0. He did really well in his test. So that's a lead in to our discussion on Dhruva Maharaj. There's five chapters that begin with chapter 8 from Canto 4 and conclude with chapter 12 of Canto 4. And in those five chapters, they're not like this is from scripture, it's just from having gone through the subject so many times. This evening's topic is this one, Seven Keys in the Journey of Dhruva Mahara. So those of you that have good memories, we're going to ask you when we're done, what are they? And those of you that don't have good memories, you can write it down. And if you don't, I'll tell you anyways. And you'll see it on the screen. So this is not a high school exam. It's a, it's a devotional remembrance of a great devotee, Dhruva, in his journey to Godhead. <clears throat> so Dhruva Maharaj uh, was the son of King Uttanapada and Uttanapada was one of the sons of Swayamabhamanu who was a direct son of Brahma who was born directly from the body of Garbhadaksha and Vishnu so it's very very early in the creation Dhruva started in this early stage of his life as a young prince. He was insulted, and so he went to the forest to get a better kingdom than his father and so forth, underwent austerities. He was received by Narada, 
and then eventually the personnel of Godhead who offered prayers. He later became a great king. And the conclusion, oops, the conclusion of the narration is, I kept it on because I wanted to repeat that. So the conclusion of the narration is up there at the top. He went back to Godhead. That's chapter 12. So next visit, we'll finish those other sections we didn't cover yet. He started as a young Chatriya prince with mixed devotion and ended up an unalloyed devotee. That's the main feature of the Prahlad story, the Dhruva story. We're also mixed. Somewhere in there is Krishna Bhakti, and somewhere in there is I want something temporary. I want to be an enjoyer of something temporary. Somewhere in there is some of that stuff. So we're mixed. And his journey shows us how to go from mixed to unmixed, and there's seven keys. That's the session today. So here's how it started. There's his father and stepmother. So the king, Uttanapada, pictured here, had two queens, and the elder queen had the firstborn son, Dhruva, and the younger queen had the second-born son, Uttam, there we see, seated on the lap of his father, Uttanapada. And seeing his brother on the lap of his father, he wanted to climb up and sit on the lap of his father, too. And Suruchi said something not very nice. This is paraphrased, but you're going to have, you want to sit on the lap of your father, you're going to have to die, take birth again from my womb to be able to get on your father's lap, as well as the throne, because she was envious. She wanted her son to be the king, but the firstborn son becomes the king, and that wasn't her son. So she was envious. And she was also proud of the, the special position she had in the mind and the heart and the life of the king. So she took liberties that really are, were disgusting. And you know, included in, if you want this, take birth from my womb, you have to worship the personality of God and get a special favor. And then you can die. Then you can take your birth from my womb. And then you can sit on your father's lap. So, you see Dhruva's reaction. He's really hurt. I don't know how much of what she said he understood, but her body language he understood. And he looked at his father, who remained silent. So he burst into tears, ran from the palace, and swiftly went to his mother. And while consoling her son, as mothers will do, she heard from those who were in the palace and heard all the nasty things that Saruchi said. And Suniti, his mother, also felt very hurt emotions, etc., etc., as detailed. And then she didn't react. That's one of the keys. She thought carefully how to best respond to the situation, and she instructed him in various ways of rather than reacting and feeling enmity towards your stepmother or wishing ill towards her for having spoken so harshly, don't do those things. Instead, uh, she gives some nice instructions. Here is one of those verses. Ma Mangalam, you would know what Mangalam, we have a Mangala Arti, auspicious Arti. And A Mangalam means inauspicious. So, my dear son, don't wish for anything inauspicious for others. Anyone who inflicts pain upon others suffers himself from that pain. 
And without further delay, you must engage yourself in worshiping the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of God. Because she, what he wanted was he wanted a kingdom, not just his father's kingdom, but better than his father's father's father, your little boy. So there's more details, but this is one of the keys. She's modeling how not to react, but to respond. And she's doing it herself. She's passing on this wisdom and the means of doing, fulfilling this wisdom to her son. Because the Supreme Personality God, if you want a kingdom, the Supreme Personality God is the source of everything, including kingdoms and whatever it is. So you will become a, a de devout worship, devoted worshiper of the Personality of Godhead. The Dhruva trusts his mother. She's passed on to him bhakti. She recognizes that his bhakti is now going to be mixed, but his bhakti is purifying. So he takes that bhakti that he passed on to her and he heads to the forest looking for Vishnu. But then find Vishnu. He finds animals and insects and birds and flora and fauna and all kinds of things. No Vishnu. But because in his heart he's searching for Vishnu, Vishnu in the heart of Narada sends Narada to come find Dhruva and give his blessings to the young boy. And one of the forms of his blessings is what you see here. He placed his benediction giving hand, Aghagnena Panina, his hand, which can drive away all sinful activities. Narada blessed Dhruva. So there's this exchange between the two. Narada instructs. Dhruva really can't follow those elevated instructions of Narada. And instead, he expresses very explicit, strong terms his determination to get a kingdom, to do austerities, and whatever is required. He wants that process to be given to him knowing that Narada has that knowledge. So this is another key. Please note, because we're going to ask you at the end what are the seven keys. He's honest with his spiritual master, what his position is and limitations are and strengths are. Narada accepts that honest expression of Dhruva and gives his further blessings. He gives his further blessings in the form of a way to achieve not only what he wants, this kingdom desire, the temporary one, but the permanent one, the lotus feet of the personality of Godhead. This is a per point that Prabhupada writes. One particular point mentioned here is that Dhruva Maharaj wanted to occupy an exalted position not by hook or by crook, but by honest means. This indicates that if Krishna offered him such a position, then he would accept it. That is the nature of a devotee. He may desire material gain, but he accepts it only if Krishna offers it. That's an important principle. Honesty in Narada's lessons, that was no to Self-honesty and honesty to Narada. And Narada gave his blessing. So he gave him this whole process of bhakti to follow. Now, in Sakya Yoga, the way in which bhakti is manifest, well, in our present age, it's just simply the chanting of the holy name. And in Sakya Yoga, when Dhruva is living, the process is the process of meditation. So he gives him meditation process. He gives him just instructions about deity worship. He gives him a mantra. He gives him a place to go and do his austerities. He tells him how to eat and how to live. It's very, very dull. 
pranayama methods, asanas methods, the whole Ashtanga Yoga system is outlined. So Dhruva very carefully follows with great faith and gratitude in his heart. He follows the instructions of Narada. Narada gives him the mantra. Here's his mantra. Let's say it. Follows rigidly. Notice down in the left corner with three principles. For a prolonged period of time, in this case it was just six months, something that he would do every day without fail consistently. And the third is with reverence to Narada, the person who gave him this process. Now, where these three come from is from Jiva Goswami. And Jiva Goswami <coughs> makes reference to Patanjali Yoga Sutras. Now some of you here know who Patanjali is. He is the number one authority in yoga. They, most people know to be yoga. And when he describes practice, Abhyasa is the Sanskrit term, it has these three elements. If any one of these is missing, then it's not practice, it's not abhyasa. But Dhruva was very fixed in his determination and his discipline practicing in this way. Every day, for a prolonged period of time, with great faith, with great reverence toward Narada. And so he made very swift progress. Here are some of the instructions in addition to the practice. This is essential for those who wish to progress spiritually. Control your mind and speech. Be peaceful. Be satisfied with eating whatever is available. Well, in our case, we don't have to go to the forest, but whatever is available. Meditate on the Lord's transcendental activities. This was another instruction given. Follow the footsteps of previous devotees. Purva, Sevita. Chant the mantra. Nara explained this mantra will fulfill all desires. So you've got this big time, I want a kingdom desire. This mantra, same with the Hare Krishna mantra will fulfill all desires. Now, it's not like, hey, this is a great plan. I do the mantra chanting and I get what I want. It's not a business deal. That mentality is a business mentality. This is devotion, but in devotion, it's what happens. He gets more than the kingdom, and he gets the spiritual realm. This kingdom, eventually, that's better than the kingdom of Lord Brahma. Receiving those teachings, Narada's, excuse me, Dhruva's heart is filled with gratitude that he offers obeisances, circumambulates Narada, and off he goes to Madhuvan. It's an actual place. Those who visit Vrindavan, probably many of you have been there. It's a Dhruva Tila, it's a little hillock, short. Not a big mountain, but a hill. And on top of the hill is where he performed his austerities. At the time, a branch of the Jamuna flowed very close by. So when he reached Madhuvan, as he was instructed, he took his bath in the river Jamuna. And very quickly, uh, the next morning, he began worshipping the Lord with his mantra. He worshipped the Lord with his mantra. And he sustained his life in this way. He ate kapita fruits and berries. 
I did a little research. What's a coffee tough root? It's, it's known to be really hard. It's so hard that normally humans don't eat it, only monkeys eat it. Because it's so hard. But that was, he was selective. He chose coffee tough roots and berries every three days. That's right. He's five years old. Think about it. But what five-year-old boy do you know that can eat every three days? <laughs> and the second month, it went to every six days, and instead it was dry grass and leaves that had fallen to the ground. Gathered up some and had a yummy piece every six days. And then in the third month, he stopped that. It was water every nine days. And he keeps going. On the fourth month, air every 12 days. He can't control the breathing process. As it described in chapter 6, he was very determined, very austere, very fixed, and achieved that goal. Breath of air every 12 days. It's not like hold your breath. It was a mystic process. By the fifth month, Dhruva completely controlled his breath and mind, stood motionless on one foot like a pillar, and meditated on the Lord's form without diversion. And as he was doing this, because the Lord was fixed in his heart, his whole body became as heavy as the whole universe and the planet Earth was pushed down by his foot, or even it says by his big toe. And not only the Earth was being pushed down like that kind of weight on it, but the air in the universe stopped because he had blocked the air from moving through his body. There were different holes in the body and no air was moving in or out. So the whole universe was becoming suffocated. And the demigods couldn't breathe. And they knew others in the universe also couldn't breathe. And so what to do? They went to Vishnu and said, we don't know what this is. This never happened before. And we need help. Can you help us? We want to breathe again. And uh, Vishnu said, no worries. It's just a little boy, son of King Uttanapada, and he has his mind so intently fixed upon me that this is what's happening. But don't worry. Everything's going to be all right. I'll personally go and stop Prabhu from performing these austerities and everything will be all right again. You can go back to your heavenly planets. And so they did. And as he promised he would do, Lord Vishnu descended to the very place, Madhuban up on top of Dhruvatila, where Dhruva was doing his austerities, and the form of the Lord, which is brilliant like lightning, and in which Dhruva Maharaj in his mature yogic process was fully absorbed in meditation, all of a sudden disappeared. Thus Dhruva was perturbed, and his meditation broke. But as soon as he opened his eyes, he saw the Supreme Personality God that personally present, just as he had been seeing the Lord in his heart. Imagine what that experience was like. He was thrilled. He was just super ecstatic. And seeing this form of the Lord before him, he offered his obeisances again and again. When Dhruva Maharaj saw his Lord just in front of him, he was greatly agitated and offered him obeisances and respect. He fell flat before him like a rod. He 
he fell flat before him like a rod and became absorbed in love of Godhead. Dhruva Maharaj in ecstasy looked upon the Lord as if he were drinking the Lord with his eyes, kissing the lotus feet of the Lord with his mouth and embracing the Lord with his arms. The Sanskrit word giva is used three times. As if he didn't literally do all those things, but he, from his heart, it was as if he was doing all those things. He was feeling ecstatic love. So now comes the next key out of seven, number four, the Lord's mercy. The Lord was considering, this little boy, he's so determined. He really wants me. He's not mature, but let me come anyways and stand before him. So he showed his mercy and recognizing that Dhruva wanted to speak, that he wasn't educated and his mind was very uncertain what to do. The personality of Godhead Vishnu very compassionately touched his head with his clutch. Here's what the text says. Although Dhruva Maharaj was a small boy, he wanted to offer prayers to the Supreme Personality Godhead in suitable language, but because he was inexperienced, he could not adjust himself immediately. The Supreme Personality Godhead being situated in everyone's heart could understand Dhruva Maharaja's awkward position. Out of his causeless mercy, He touched his conch shell to the forehead of Dhruva Maharaj, who stood before him with folded hands. The very next verse has this explanation. Dhruva Maharaj never went to any school or academic teacher to learn the Vedic conclusion, but because of his devotional service to the Lord, as soon as the Lord appeared and touched his forehead with his shell, automatically the entire Vedic conclusion was revealed to him. Now that's not ordinary. Normally you have to go to school. But Brahma, his great-grandfather, he received knowledge in the same manner. He had mantra, and he chanted his mantra, and he was engaged in austerity, and the knowledge was revealed within his heart. He didn't have to go to school. It wasn't any school to go to. It's just the personality of God and his mantra. So his great grandson, Dhruva, saying, he received mercy from Dharada. He took that mercy from Dharada and he stayed with it and cultivated it inwardly and externally both very deeply. And by the mercy of Lord Vishnu, everything within the Vedas became known to him. So, you know, it's not advisable to imitate. But we can understand the principle is the realization came by mercy. The mercy prompted by the mercy of Narada, which was prompted by the mercy of his mother. And where she got mercy from, we don't know. But she must have gotten it from somewhere. She was an exalted person. And so he offers 12 beautiful prayers. And amongst those prayers, he speaks of the touch of the Lord, which enlightened his senses, all of his senses, especially his speech, so he could speak properly. He speaks of the Lord being the shelter of the devotees and the shelter of everyone. And another one of Dhruva's prayers of these 12 is very strong humility. That's natural for someone who's elevated in spiritual consciousness. Is they're <coughs> profoundly humble. So he is expressing his humility in this way. Previously, in spite of having you who are like a kaupakaturum, Acharanti Kalkalkaturum, a desire tree, which can give liberation from birth and death, 
Instead, for a foolish persons like me, desire something temporary, something for sense gratification, which is available even for those in hellish conditions. How unfortunate. That's one of his prayers. It's a, an expression of humility. And he's feeling it profoundly. And then another one of his prayers, he's comparing the ananda that he's experiencing from prema, prema ananda, the ecstasy of love for the personality of Godhead, the happiness of that love for the personality of Godhead cannot be compared to what the best of jnanis and yogis experience. My Lord, the transcendental bliss derived from meditating upon your lotus feet Tava Padapadva Dhyana or hearing about your glories from pure devotees Bhavaj Janakata Shavanena Vasya is so unlimited that it is far beyond the stage of Brahmananda. This is a nice discussion which we'll get to when we get to it. Therefore, a concluding prayer as he wants association with devotees. Specifically, he says, it's through the association of Narada that I've attained what I've attained, but I don't want to go back to where I was, and so I need the association of devotees to help sustain me in this elevated position. So, please, please keep me always in the association of your devotees, so I can stay fixed in your devotion. The personality of Godhead is very pleased by his prayers and says, Padram te, let all good fortune be to you. There's several verses, but it's, it's the essence. He grants him the kingdom of his father, which he will be, become a ruler of, for 36,000 years, that's a long time, because it's Sati Yuga. People live for 100,000 years maximum. So for us, it'd be like being a king for 36 years, because you just subtract by three zeros in this own the life duration. And then after that, you're going to attain a very special place you wanted a king to rule a kingdom better than Brahma? It's yours. Guru Loka. And we spent some time, a little bit, discussing what Guru Loka is, where it is, how does it work. And offering those Bhadram Te, all those benedictions to Dhruva, Lord Vishnu departs on the path of Guru just as he came, returning to Sri Now, how does Dhruva take it? Well, he has, like we sometimes have, he has mixed emotions. He was ecstatic. He just had a conversation with the personality of Godhead. He touched him with his poncho and so forth. And all the knowledge became revealed to him and so forth. But at the same time, feeling great regret that he had this really dumb desire of wanting something in the material side. Artarti, in the language of Bhagavad Gita. He wanted material wealth, material opulence, material position. He wanted material stuff in exchange for his devotional service. How foolish. How lamentable. So he's feeling very sad that he's been given an instruction to go back to the palace and rule for 36,000 years. So after he gathers his emotions, that's what he does. So in this section, it's not from the, the Bhagavatam, but from other uh, Hari Bhakti Siddhartha and other references where he says, although he had gone to Madhavan, given up his kingdom of his father and had gotten a spiritual master like Narad Muni, 
he was still thinking of revenge against his stepmother and wanted to occupy an exalted post within this material world. The image is showing pieces of <coughs> broken glass and a diamond. So this is what he was looking for. Instead, he got a diamond, most valuable jewel of the Lord's Association. So there's a long section. He gathers his emotions together. Little boy, now he's five and a half. And off he goes to the, the palace. The messenger tells the king, your son is returning. The king is in disbelief but ecstatic and he comes to greet Druva, a big procession coming into the kingdom. Details and details and details of the opulence that was arranged for Druva's return. Druva's completely forgiving Suruchi, nasty Suruchi, completely forgiving his father, completely forgiving his stepbrother. He had gone beyond this material thing to get back mentality and all of that unclean stuff. He was gone, he was beyond it. Gone. Squeaky clean. And so he goes back, he is honored by his father, he grows up, he becomes the king. His father goes off to the forest following his son to become elevated in bhakti. He rules for 36,000 years, and after his rulership, he turns the kingdom over to his son. He goes to Badrigashram, and again he engages in what he did when he was in the forest as a small boy. And as he's doing this, <clears throat> again he experiences some of the same ecstasy. Because of his transcendental bliss, incessant tears flowed from his eyes. His heart melted, and there was shivering and standing of hairs all over his body, thus transformed in a trance of devotional service. Dhruva Maharaj completely forgot his bodily existence, and thus he immediately became liberated from material bondage. And the way the story ends is uh, descending from the sky comes a Vaikuntha airplane, a Vaikuntha Vimana, directly from the spiritual world. There's Nanda and Sunanda, the two agents of Lord Vishnu. Uh, invite him. We were sent by Lord Vishnu. Get on board. We're taking you back to Godhead. So he does some rituals before he gets on board and uh, circumambulates the vimana. And then as he's getting on the vimana, death personified approaches him. He smiles and he places his foot on the head of death personified and gets on the vimana. As he's getting on the vimana, there's this detailed description an important one also, of how his, he didn't leave his body like one does at the time of death, but he became fully, his body became fully spiritualized. We'll say it again. He didn't leave his body, his body became fully spiritualized. It said, luminous like the sun, radiating like the sun. And in that state, that spiritualized body, he got on the vimana, and as they're about to take off, he said, wait, wait, wait. I can't leave without my mother. And the agent smiled, you're so compassionate. Look over your shoulder over there. There's this other vimana. That's, that's for your mom. Here's the image where he's getting on the vimana. It said the, it's as big as a house. So now we're ready for the seventh key and the conclusion. He had intense, profound gratitude towards his mother. Now his mother wasn't just like provided the body and took care of feeding him and all those things that mothers do naturally of any species, but 
she gave him bhakti. And he felt profound, he benefited from it immensely, and he felt, felt profound gratitude. I can't go back to Godhead without my mother. Now, she, it was several things. She went back to Godhead she, because she did this fantastic service. But in her own, of, of giving her son bhakti. But in her own right, she was an elevated Vaishnavi. Super elevated Vaishnavi. Deep faith in Vishnu, which we discussed a bit. So she was qualified on her own, plus she had done this nice service for her son. So she was ready to go back to Godhead too. She didn't go to the forest and do all of what Dhruva did. She didn't become the next king and do all of what Dhruva did. She just was like super mom. And she went back to Godhead. She did her, her service. And each of us, we have our service, whatever that is. And we just do that with genuine faith and devotion in the personality of Godhead, become purified, and go back to Godhead. And when those from whom we receive bhakti and instructions in bhakti is a key that you feel gratitude. So this is key number seven. This says gratitude in the list that you'll see at the end. So as he's going back to Godhead, he's passing through the universe and waves Hari Bol to all the demigods as he's passing through those other planets. And they're showering flowers like you see in the back. So, here's the seven keys, little review. So, there's this respond instead of react, and the capacity to do that, the understanding and the wisdom to do that came from his mother, because that was what she was doing and was able to do, and she passed it on, and so he received it. We need to have a in the language of the Sri Vaishnava commentators, we need, a, we need a mediator, or this other language is a modern Western term, caregiver. We receive from someone who, had, who was close to the personality of Godhead, and on our behalf, they give instructions and offer prayers to Bhagavan. That's a key, to go from mixed to pure. We may receive instructions. I'm not going to ask you the quiz question because of time. We may receive instructions that may look to us where we are. It's a little high. And I'm down here, and the instruction is way up there. So rather than feeling, oh, I'm unworthy, we just are honest with where we are. And those who are guiding us ask them to help us get there. What are some incremental steps we can take to get there? And so he got Narada's blessing to get there. He was very determined and engaged in mind and sense control per the instructions of Narada how to do that. He then received, because of following his instructions of Narada, he received Vishnu's mercy. And when we receive Vishnu's mercy, we're going to receive strength beyond our own strength. That's the good news. It's not, it's not just dependent upon our own determination. Because, you know, which is stronger? Our determination or the, the field of the material, power of the material energy? We'll be defeated. So we need strength beyond our strength. We need descending mercy. We need effort and we need mercy. But you'll get mercy if you take shelter of, with discipline and determination, the instructions of your spiritual master. And as you progress, this is key number five, humility becomes deeper, more and more profound and genuine, not now you see it, now you don't. I'm humble, and then I'm not humble. I'm humble, and then I'm growling at somebody. Not like that. 
consistently, profoundly humble. That's a step in the progress of reaching pure bhakti from mixed devotion. Uh, there's some regret in, my, in the past back there. I was involved in the temporary and trying to be the enjoyer of the temporary. I was even approaching God to help me get the temporary and be the enjoyer of the temporary. And so regretting our, our past material involvement. It's part of humility, but it's a, it's a particular item. And carrying forward. In this case, Dhruva carried forward. He went back and ruled the kingdom because that's that was his duty. And finally, this profound gratitude to his mother, or in our case, whoever it is that has helped us in the bhakti process. And there's probably lots of people beside you first person who gave us the mantra or gave us a book or gave us the us at the temple and they were kind to us and all, all of those kinds of people but there's all, there's all kinds of worthy of gratitude personalities in our journey and feeling gratitude towards what you towards them and what you receive from them it's a key so now we're going to do the key that helps get all seven keys. And we're done. And those that attended the earlier sessions, you've seen this slide before. It's an important one. That's why you saw it before and I've seen it for the third time. The key of acceptance. When we don't accept an undesired event, in Dhruva's case, when he was insulted, it becomes anger. And he became really angry. It says his lips were trembling. When we accept it, it becomes tolerance. When we don't accept uncertainty, it becomes fear. When we accept it, it becomes adventure. It becomes sannyasi for a while. There's lots of uncertainty, lots of adventure. But I'm sure it's true for householders too. Like you don't know what's next. And sure enough, it's different than what you thought it was going to be. Like, when we don't accept another's bad behavior towards us, it becomes hatred. When we accept it, it becomes forgiveness. Notice these. For, forgiveness, for example, it's just a mode of goodness, quality, or characteristic, or trait, or value, forgiveness. When we don't accept another success, it becomes jealousy. When we accept it, it becomes inspiration. Acceptance is the key to handling life well. This is a Bhagavad Gita message. It's a Dhruva Maharaj message. It's a spiritual message for anybody that wants to become spiritually progressive in life. So it's very important. And in Bhagavad Gita, we know this as the principle of surrender. Now surrender to Krishna doesn't mean you become like, you know, a, a passive blob or something. Anything that happens is okay because I just accept everything that, because it's okay. It just means you don't become a reactive personality and get into anger and all those other things, fear, etc., etc., hatred. You consider carefully in the response, you measured response while accepting the circumstance. And uh, accept the key of acceptance and all the other seven keys will be yours. Those who attended some of the earlier sessions, this message was in a very prominent message in Suniti's message to Dhruva in Narada's message to Dhruva, finally in Vishnu's message to Dhruva, it's, it's, it's essential. And if we don't take that which is essential, we'll just be in the struggling mood. Endlessly struggling mood. There's no end to it. 
lifetime after lifetime, not just moment after moment. And for us, our journey back home starts with the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. That's our principal means of deliverance. And from that comes all so many other things that we can do to make progress on the journey back home, back to Godhead. So there's a little summary of five chapters of Canto for Srimad Bhagavatam, the life of Guru Maharaj. There's many more details. I believe the earlier sessions were recorded, so you can find out how to get those recordings, listen, or view the, the images like you see here. Because there's a lot there. It's, it's, it's a very celebrated section of the Bhagavatam for a good reason. There's a lot in there. Besides, like, it's an interesting storyline. You know, the bad guys and the good guys storyline. It's, it's very profound, very practical for those of us that have mixed devotion and want sincerely, maybe, you know, in increments that's okay, but to go towards unmixed devotion. There's elements that teach us how to go from where we are to where we want to go. And Dhruva is a great role model. Nice to see so many people show up. Nice. Yes. Can you speak? Yes. Yes. In that verse, Krishna says, Apichet Sutara Charo. Apichet means even if. Like it's not going to happen. But let's just say hypothetically, imagine it will happen. In Dhruva's case, it happened. Su Durachar. Su means very, Dur means bad and Achar is behavior. Very bad behavior. Sudurachar. Apichat Sudaracharo. Bhajate Mam Ananya. Bhak. Consistently, someone is an Ananya Bhakta, undivided devotee. But supposing, and in Dhruva's case, it happened. So, how did it happen? Prabhupada's expression is like. The tide comes and it goes, and the tide comes and it goes, and the tide comes and it goes, and here comes a tsunami. Something agitated, the, the, the Earth's atmosphere, or the structure below the water, and a big kaboom, and it made a tsunami, and here comes this tidal wave that just goes beyond the in and the outgoing tide covers the land completely. And when the water recedes, it's back to income and outgo of the tide. So it's just the circumstance of material nature. Because the nature of the person is anandivak. But here comes this tidal wave. So how does it happen? Quirk of nature. Or well, we could say, in the case of Dhruva, one possible way of saying, it was arranged 
so that Dhruva could receive and we could hear the instructions of Swami Bhagavan and then next of Kubera for our edification. What to do when we find somebody that becomes covered who is an Ananya Bhakta. How should we view it? We should view it like Krishna views it. Sadhu Eva Samantavya. So he didn't stop being a sadhu. He just fell victim to this tsunami. Circumstantial, too much attachment to his brother. No, the devotee doesn't become too attached. He's anasaktasya vishayan yataram upayunjitaha. He's not anasaktasya. There's no asakti, there's anasaktasya. There's no attachment. But he became attached and took revenge. Like part two, he took revenge before, now he's taking revenge again. How did it happen? Just circumstance. <coughs> and then the next verse, Shipram Bhavati Dharma Krishna says, I personally set everything straight. I correct the whole situation. But he did so through Swami Manu. And all it took was some words. And he was the tsunami had receded. of Arjuna is explicitly super soul Krishna arranged for Arjuna to be covered so that he took the position that's anaryan or pridaya or you know inappropriate for some elevated person just not at all appropriate by Krishna's arrangement so that's another way to look at it Say, say, one who becomes dear to the personality Godhead and just thinks favorably or offers prayers on behalf of someone, that's powerful. The power is the personality Godhead and someone who's close to the personality Godhead. So, you know, we could think, well, gosh, I'm not close to the personality Godhead, this little thing on a fig tree where well, I'm, I'm nothing. But to, to Krishna, you're not nothing. You're not Narada Muni or maybe not Suniti, but you're important. And your prayers on behalf of someone is powerful. Your well-wishing on behalf of another is very powerful. Your well-wishing is the conduit of the mercy of, of Krishna to go to that person. Just your well-wishing. So be a well-wisher. Even of people who are like Suruchi, mean, nasty. What happens to Suruchi, several things happen. She also gets it. it you know, it took a while. But when Dhruva came back, she was feeling very sad and sorrowful for what she did. It took a while. 
But Dhruva just accepted her as if nothing happened. And when Dhruva accepted her as if nothing happened, imagine what that did to her heart. It's not like, now I'm free. It's, she, she continued to feel this little boy has become so exalted. Not like she was taking credit for his becoming exalted, but just his nature is so wonderful. She became purified by his association. And another thing that happened as a consequence, because she had made an offense to this little boy, she got a reaction for that offense to that little boy. And the offense, this is what Vishnu tells Dhruva when after Dhruva's prayers. He says what's going to happen, the upcoming attractions. And one of the things that's going to happen is your brother, Uttam, will be killed by the Yakshas later in life. And his mother, your stepmother, will go mad hearing that your her son has been killed by the Yakshas or by a Yaksha. And she'll go into a burning forest fire and die in a state of madness. The commentary says Vishnu said that because Vishnu knew that Dhruva had this get back mentality, which he had now given up. But you know, there's justice in the universe. It may not be in the moment, but there's justice in the universe. People that do some harsh things to an innocent person, or to speak of a devotee, there's justice in the universe, not like, hey, they'll get theirs. I feel good about that. But there's justice in the universe. There's justice in the universe. It may not be before our eyes, it may not be in the moment, it may not be the way that we would want to see things happen. We're not in control. There is justice in the universe. There's a Supreme Personality of Godhead who was overseeing everything. Now, it didn't have to play itself out that way because who knows what happened in between Dhruva's coming back and her losing her life or her son's losing his life. We don't know those details. So it didn't have to play itself out that way. It played itself out that way. There's justice in the universe. And we may have done something hurtful to someone else. Most likely, somewhere along the line, let's say at least unintentionally, or in a, in a moment of whatever, you know, whenever we're feeling some negative emotion, we may say or do something that's hurtful to another, and later on we feel, gosh, why did I do that? Why did I speak that way or something? And there's probably a whole string of hurt people behind us. We're responsible for that. And how that's going to work itself out, that's up to Krishna. There's two Prabhupada disciples here in the back, so I will share a little story. Mother Rasigya. We both know about the Rasigya. So, <clears throat> I had the good fortune of attending a Java retreat in Ojai some years ago when Rasigya was attending, and it was it was intended to be it was called a retreat, yoga retreat, a meditation workshop or something like that for leaders and. Um, the person who organized it was a disciple of Bhakti Tirtha Swami, who after he departed wanted to do something that he knew Bhakti Tirtha Swami wanted. He wanted leaders who are so busy dealing with followers, they don't have so much time to be with each other in very nourishing, wholesome, spiritual association. So Bhakti Tirtha Swami wanted that, so his disciple, Krishna Sukta, made that arrangement. It was in Ojai really nice place, a, a Buddhist retreat way up on a mountaintop, and you can oversee a valley, and over there's the ocean. It was really nice. And Russ, Mother Russi Gal was one of the people. There was some other people. 
Jimona, one of the first times I had association with Mother Jimona. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. So, Rasika, and we had sharing at the end. And she said, I've been looking forward to this for three months. It's every day, it's just been absorbed and absorbed and absorbed and absorbed in anticipation. And then when we started our 64 round day, what happened was my mind became flooded with one thing after the next thing after the next thing, so many ways in which I hurt people unintentionally, that it all came to my mind. And it didn't stop, it just kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. And I was crying. But you didn't notice I was I went I went outside because I couldn't take it anymore. It was so painful. I'd given so much pain to other people and I didn't stop. And then finally I just threw my hands up in the air and said, Krishna, you can do with me what you like. And then all of a sudden the mood changed. And I felt Krishna's mercy forgiving me or something, see if those weren't exactly his words, but something like that, she's just like, the whole mood shifted. Because it was resistance and purification, it was a type of purification for her. That's what I was taking it as. This regret for a Vaishnava is a form of tapa, according to Bhakti no Thakur. And that's where she, on the subtle plane, that's what she was getting, purification. So there's justice in the universe. And you know, very exalted person. So. Any further comments or questions? I can't hear you. How much time do we have for what? Another question. You have a question? I do. You do? Is it a good one? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. If it's a good one, you can ask it. <laughs> It says what? Accepting bad behavior. Accepting bad behavior, yeah, okay. I'm not sure I understand accepting bad behavior. It's, it's a very it's, 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 it, The answer is forgiveness. That's what accepting bad behavior means. Okay. How do you really accept? Well, I mean, it's really easy. I don't see it. So, <laughs> let's do it subjectively. I'm thinking of a circumstance where someone dealt with me in a very harsh way. Unnecessarily, inappropriately, severely harsh. Now, I could just get into this No, I could do that. No, wait a minute. Just, let me just, I'm, I'm responding to your question. What does it mean? I could do that. I didn't do that. I don't want to do that. I know it's not, that's a lower, it's an animal response. I don't want to be an animal and have an animal response. So I can make a choice of saying, you know what? I don't wish the justice in the universe is going to get that person and fix their wagon. I'm not thinking that either. I don't want to think that. I'm not thinking that. It happened. Who knows? I don't know. This is something that I've learned. Probably there's some pain inside that person that caused that hurtful behavior, and I just happen to be proximate. And they're probably doing hurtful behavior to other people because inside there's this deep hurt. And they're acting from that place of deep hurt towards others. 
and I happen to be one of them. And there's probably others. So it's not like the behavior is okay. This is something that I struggled with as a teenager. Can, can you see me? Okay. I didn't grow up in a Hare Krishna family. I grew up in a Christian family. And one of the teachings that Christ gives is, you know, that there's contact, the Sermon of the Mount. What's the most important teaching that you have? You've given so many teachings. What's the most important? So he says two things. And the second thing is the one that I struggled with. Love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. I struggled with it. Because I didn't love my neighbor as myself. Like, there are certain neighbors. I just like... <laughs> I never liked bullies. And I'm supposed to love the bully? I'm sorry, I can't know. I'm a failure as a Christian because that's the most important teaching and I can't do it. And I had this existential dilemma as a kid. And I didn't get any answer from anybody without listing the people I went to. <coughs> so now, then I Can you stand? Because I want to have eye contact so you can see one another. Thank you. So, uh, I'll just, you know, just put it on hold. I didn't resolve it. I didn't obsess about it. I just put it on hold. Then I became a devotee. Some nice things happened. I became a devotee. Then I started to understand what it meant. Because this is your question. So there's a, it's, in this, it's in the teachings of Christ. Hate the sin, not the sinner. You heard that one before? Have you heard it before? Yes. No. Yes. Yes, okay. So the behavior that's mean is not okay. But that's not the person. So you can accept the person and from the person who is in a lot of pain, suffering, whatever it is, from that pain, suffering, whatever it is, comes this hurtful behavior. Not only towards me, but towards other people. So you can be forgiving of the person not to say the behavior that's bad behavior towards us and or others is okay. But you can be forgiving because wherever that came from, there's a lot of hurt and pain. Say the same thing the other way. Same thing. How can you be a benefit to that person that did that bad behavior. It's not by feeling hatred towards them. That's never going to solve anything. It's just, you just feel negative and the other person isn't getting any benefit. But if you can be forgiving, that is to say, pray for the soul of that person. That they be forgiven by God. I'll give a little example and I'm going to end with this response. Um, you heard of the Amish people? Yes. Yes. So, um, some years ago, one summer, two or three years ago, um, some teenagers were driving by in a car. There were two Amish girls walking along the side of the road and they shot them dead and drove off. And the village elder, because that's how they function, the village elder called the whole community to go to their place of worship and pray for the soul of the perpetrators for forgiveness for their bad act. It doesn't mean that the act is okay. It's forgiveness. And, and their answer, that they, when they were asked by the media, wow, why this response? And their response was, we have this value that we hold and we live by. 
and I forget the language of that value that they hold or live by, but that it's, we, we live by our values. And our values it is we should try to connect with God in all circumstances of life. So they wanted to connect with God, and not by retribution and retaliation, or hurt, or anger, or hatred towards the perpetrator. There's other examples. There's Vedic examples. About, but it's forgiveness of the wrong doer, not the wrong. That's the acceptance. You have to go to a spiritual platform to, to be there and stay there. And otherwise you can't be there and stay there. It's going to be circumstantial at best. Cosmetic at best. At best. And otherwise it becomes like an animal response. You hurt me. And out come the fangs and the claws and the fight back. Defend, protect. Now there may be, it's a, it doesn't mean in all circumstances of life you're just passive. It, you know, perhaps if the police brought the you know the wrongdoers before the village elders, would you like to file a murder case against these wrongdoers? Maybe yes. By Vedic standards, the answer is yes. And there's a, but the, the reason is compassion for the soul. It gets a little complex. But forgiveness, it starts with forgiveness. Then you have higher consciousness and you can think on a spiritual platform and choose on a spiritual platform rather than just reacting. Well, it's certainly not retribution. Um, two things, and I'm going to end with this. You can ignore that the memory will stay there unless you resolve it. It'll come back, it'll come back, it'll come back. You'd like to tuck it under the rug. People that are involved in counseling don't advise that you just ignore. I'm going to make, I'm going to end with this. There's a reference when you have the time, go to your computer, Google in TED Talk vulnerability. And you'll find a TED talk by Benet Brown, and she talks exactly about don't ignore it. It doesn't work. And that's not like a spiritual message, that she's a researcher. It doesn't work. <coughs> it comes back, it lingers. It's, it's stuck in your system, and it doesn't go away. You have to resolve it. And the resolution doesn't come from strike back. The, the, react. You have to go to a higher, a plane of higher consciousness. In the plane of higher consciousness, it may be that the wrongdoer needs some punishment or some um, accountability for their bad act. It's not coming from a place of revenge. It's coming from a place of well-wishing. It's easier said than done, but that's the principle. Thank you very much. She will come with my feet.